this okay? She said no. Um, yes, tonight we have uh, from the Plymouth Plantation before and from the. Uh, is that right? Is that I, I say wrong already? No, no, no. You missed. Okay, all right. Richard. Uh, all the way from Plymouth. <laughs> yes. Oh, from Wareham. Uh, you're from Wareham, but oh. you work at Plymouth Plantation. Yes, right? Yes. No? Okay. Yeah. And you're not a cook. You're a pastry chef. I'm a baker. A baker. Okay. Say, there you go. I, uh, whatever. I told you, baker. Oh, you did? Okay. No, no, I was wrong again. All right. I'm continually wrong. All right. A baker from the uh, thing. And she also has musical instruments, which is a plus. I didn't realize that, so, uh, you know, we, we talked about the, no. Richard, come sit down. Yeah, Richard, come sit down. <laughs> come sit. Take a, come sit. <laughs> come have a seat. Are you going to do a takeover? Are we, I don't know. Yes. Um, are we done? We ready? Yes. yes. Go ahead, go. Right. We're late. Go. Tonight's speaker and, is oh, no, no more do, uh, Carolyn Morrow. And, yes. and, Morrow. and Morrow. Nick Morrow. Yes. As in, you know, and Jedi Irish Richard or was going to introduce her, but he's tied up. <laughs> I'm going to tie him up. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome everybody to the meeting of the Lakeville Historical Society. And uh, our guest speaker is going to tell us about uh, baking and cooking and dulcimers and good stuff. Ben? You ready? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Down in Solo Valley, in a lonesome place, where the wild birds do whistle and their notes do increase, I bear my pretty sorrow. I bid you, bid you, and I dream of pretty sorrow. Wherever I go, my love, she won't have me. Oh, I understand. She wants a freeholder who owns house and land. She wants, I knew I would do that. Who owns house and land and can buy her all the fine things that a big house can hold. My love, she won't have me, so I understand. <coughs> I dream of pretty sorrow wherever I go. That's Appalachia. That's Appalachian music. <laughs> um, these are Appalachian dulcimers. Uh, we're going to have a cakewalk a little bit later. Um, we'll explain what it's all about. The um, dulcimer originated here in this country. It's an original. It originated in the mountains where when the settlers came over, Ireland, Scotland, Germany, and they traveled. They ended up settling in North Carolina, in the mountains, because it reminded them so much of their homeland. And their life was not easy. Their life was amazing, amazing people. Going to Appalachia is like stepping back in time. 70, 80 years ago, maybe even further. They do everything. They were totally, totally self-sufficient. After they scrabbled out a place to live and build a shelter and start farming and all the necessary things that they needed to do to live by. They did everything themselves, totally self-sufficient from the outside world. And when you get to meet them and get to know them, they remain from the outside world for a long time. It's just, they're just a totally whole different kind of um, people. Loving, talented, incredible. Cooks, artists. There's a folk school in North Carolina called the John C. Campbell Folk School. And 
It was founded by a Massachusetts woman, Olive Dean Campbell. She and her husband, John, had traveled all the other countries, Denmark, um, Finland, Sweden, and they were impressed with the folk schools in those countries where everything was taught and there was um, no comparison, no competition. Every, everything was what you could do. She wanted a school back in this country and that was her whole idea, her and John, to come back here and establish a folk school here. They started traveling in uh, different areas of the South. When they got to Brass Town, if you can picture this little, little tiny town, every corner here, we have a Dunkin' Donuts. Every corner there, they have a chapel. It, it's just, they're just amazing people. And these little chapels on every corner, every neighbor, um, they could hold maybe 40 or 50 people. When the locals got wind that they were looking to open a folk school, they went to the chapel to greet them and there were over 200 people waiting for them. They wanted this so bad for their children, for their community. They just wanted this school so bad. These people were farmers, um, did cattle farming, everything. When you, when you go to the folk school, which I'm gonna tell you more about, they wanted this so bad, these farmers actually gave their land and their farms to make this happen. When you go to the folk school, there's a little history center, and in there, there's a, a wall covered with little cards that are about the size of a um, business card, a small business card, just about the size of my cards here. And that wall is plastered with cards with everything ever donated by the farmers to make this happen. It might have been land, it might have been many, it was their home, it might have been labor, it might have been material, it was anything at all that they could give to do to make this happen. And it did, it's just the most incredible talented, spiritual. I started going, oh, maybe about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer. I've always loved music. Any kind of music, I just love it. And I was always listening to the dulcimer. And my mother heard it. And um, she went on vacation. She went to uh, visit my sister. She was, where was Sandy at the time, in Alabama? Alabama. So she went to visit my sister and um, happened to go in a pawn shop and there was a dulcimer for sale. So she bought it, brought it home, gave it to me for my birthday. It was all wrapped up in a towel sheet and said, now you learn to play the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I started it. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> but, um, and I did start going to the folk school to learn about the dulcima. And after going, I think it was my third trip down, I always flew in, they pick you up, take you to school, you stay there all week. You don't have to do a thing but what you went there to learn. You can learn in a week what would take you six months to learn here. The instructors come from all over the world. They're the best. Um, the third time I went, I flew in. They pick you up in Atlanta, you go to school. The third time I went, my son said to my husband, Dad, you do realize she's not coming home? And 
it was close. <laughs> so we did end up building a cabin down there. And the people, I can't tell you how incredible the people are there. They're amazing. We ended up building a cabin and we would go down and it was built with the big logs and the chinking. And we would have to go down and check on the progress. And I went um, one time, they called me to come look at the fireplace and I wanted to cry. Oh, I could cry. It was so modern. <laughs> I, it was just so out of place. So the gentlemen that were doing the work, I said, you don't understand. I want this cabin to look like Abe Lincoln could have lived here. Ah, oh, they took the entire thing apart and rebuilt everything. And it did look just like Abe Lincoln could have been there. It, that's how wonderful it came out. But it was a couple um, towns away from the school and driving in the mountains is really scary. I mean, you just can't imagine these skinny little roads with drops as, as far as you can see. And in the morning, it's always so thick with fog, you can't see your nose in front of your face. So I wanted to be near the school, so we sold the cabin and we eventually found a place within walking distance of the folk school. And that got me started learning um, dulcima classes. But over the years, I've taken others. I've done, I've built a dulcima, I've built a banjo, I make cornhusk dolls, I built a two and a half foot tall a uh, steel rooster in my blacksmithing class. And he's beautiful. <laughs> he's too big. <laughs> but there isn't anything you can't learn. Chairs. To go, I've learned to build chairs. Um, I did take a, a hearth cooking. I've taken a number of them, but every one of them just, they're just wonderful people. The hearth cooking there, this woman here, Kay Moss, she teaches at a um, Shield Museum in Gastonia, North Carolina. And when I took her house cooking, uh, she was doing this book. And she asked me, because I was a baker, if I would, for her as a favor, if I would work out the great cake for her book. And I said, I'd be glad to. Well, when you do anything with this woman, you do it. The folk school was founded in 1925. Over the years, the big, big, big visitor center, not a visitor center, the Keith House. It's like you're coming into somebody's big living room with these massive stone fireplaces. Um, that's where everybody congregates. That's where the entire community comes. That's where everything happens in Brasstown is in Keith House. But over the years, they've built an amazing um, painting studio. That's one of their biggest drop. Blacksmithing and um, painting are two of their biggest um, attendees. Excuse me. But every... Every single studio is just unbelievable, just un, just gorgeous. So when I was doing this cooking class, um, <coughs> the kitchen is new and it, it is a huge fireplace, but this woman, everything had to be 18th century. When you walked into the room, in other classes use these studios. Everything was gone. There was nothing but redware, woodenware. It was like stepping back in time. And that's how she teaches her classes. There's nothing new in there. There's, there's no utensils in there. There's nothing but the way it would have been done then and nothing with those items to work with. So when I agreed to do the great cake, 
I had to do this in red whip pans that were not that big and in a Dutch oven in front of the fireplace. And thank God the cake came out. <laughs> it came out good. But um, when, you, when you take a class at the folk school, you're with like-minded community. And you might start a, at your class at 9 in the morning and get done at dinner time. But there isn't a class that doesn't go back and work into the night time, too. Um, your meals, you pay for them, but your meals are provided. And the chef there is absolutely, absolutely amazing. At the end of your week, stay there. Every class, they have a show and tell at the end of the week. And all the instructors come in and meet. And people have tables set up with what they've accomplished that week. And it will just blow your mind what, what is done. Um, it's just, just absolutely incredible. So when the cake was all done, it was pretty big. And not like we frost a cake today. We frost a cake with buttercream, very sweet. Back then, they would have baked the cake. And um, you're familiar with Dutch ovens? Yeah. You bring the coals out of the fireplace. You put your Dutch oven in. You put your baked good in the Dutch oven. You put the cover on top, and then you cover the top with coals. So you're heating from both. So the entire cake had to be baked that way. And the frosting is just egg white and sugar. They would beat it and spread it on the cake, but then they would put the cake by the fire and let it dry and it would harden. So it would be a hard glaze. So the cake was all done. And the folk school has the most amazing garden. Oh my God. They serve the fresh vegetables and everything from the garden in the dining hall. And it just so happened I was lucky that week that the herb garden was tons of beautiful flowers. So the cake had flowers, candy doll down it. It was lovely and everyone approved of it. So that was the cake that went into this book. <laughs> but they call it a great cake, a wedding cake, a christening cake. Um, you can find them online. If you find a, a recipe, go ahead and try it because it is just absolutely incredible. So delicious. Kind of a pound cake, but lots of spices, lots of butter, lots of eggs, lots of currants. Um, but really a wonderful, um, wonderful lady doing great things. I brought, these, uh, these were sent to me from the folk school. And I brought catalogs too, and I don't know as if I have enough catalogs to go around, but there's plenty of flyers. But the um, the mountain people, they they worked from sun up till sundown, and there's no such thing as idle hands. Doesn't matter how old you are, there was a chore for you to do. And in the evening, when all was done, their way of relaxing was the music. And um, that's how the dulcima originated, was that's their form of entertainment. In um, 1925, when um, all of her, her husband, John, passed away in the meantime, but her very good friend, Marguerite Bidstrup, came to her side between the two of them. The school was established. And there are so many people that I've met there that um, I did, I forgot one class I took for documenting. I met so many people that I felt should have been documented that I wanted to learn how to do it. Um, what questions to ask, how to go about getting the whole thing started. And um, after I took that, um, I was always asking my mother questions and she would never answer me. So I finally told her it was for my class and all of a sudden she opened up and started telling me what I wanted to know. So it was good in that respect. But um, the people that I've met, uh, Kay Moss, the cook, another lady, I, I would love for you to all come up and take a look. I brought a few books I, and 
this one little guy here, I'll tell you what he's all about. But um, come up, please, and take a look. Another lady, um, when I tell you about the ballads, the songs of the ballads are just so heartwarming. They're so beautiful. They're also murder ballads, and they're all play party tunes. It is very customary for them to just roll back the rug if they had one, move the furniture, and have a dance, and have a party right, right there. Um, their songs are just incredible. Um, Cecil Sharp, I'm sure you've heard of Cecil Sharp. He started going to the mountains to collect music. And he was traveling around, and someone told him about um, Jane Hicks Gentry. She knew more songs than anyone in the mountains. So he went and he looked her up, and she ran a boarding house. She had nine daughters, and she raised them in this boarding house. So uh, Cecil Sharp went to visit her to ask her for some tunes. Well, he had to keep repeatedly going back because she did have more tunes than anybody could ever imagine. But um, also, she has jack tales, which are, we've heard fairy tales, little Jack and the Beanstalk and all that stuff. Well, her jack tales, they're scary. I mean, they are incredible. So she, and you can purchase those today. Anything you want to know about this kind of thing, go to the Library of Congress. They have an amazing um, collection, and you can still buy these things today. But anyway, Social Shop went to visit her and collect all her songs, which he did. And one day he went to visit her. It, when he first started going to visit her, um, it was said she wasn't a handsome woman. So um, he asked her if um, he should sit with her or if he should go to the other room. And she told him, if you don't mind looking at me, well, I don't mind looking at you. So that's how they, they started. And um, this is all about Jane Hicks Gentry. Amazing people, just amazing people. This lady here, Betty Smith, she's well known, very well known, a dulcimer player, a historian. And um, she wrote this book and she does a one woman show um, play on Jane Hicks Gentry. The house that Jane Hicks Gentry ran is a boarding house. I wanted to see it in the worst way. I just wanted, I just had to see it. So on one of our trips to North Carolina, I had friends in Blue Ridge. In the meantime, I had had a local carpenter build me a coffin. I wanted a wooden coffin and I wanted it to be built exactly like it would have been built a couple hundred years ago. So he started going to the Wayham Library and studying coffins. And it, it's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> well, after that, he had, he had to build five more because friends wanted them. So I had to order five more coffins. Well, my friend Carol in Blue Ridge, she wanted a coffin. I said, okay, we'll bring it with us when we come down. So we decided we were going to go visit Jane Hicks Gentry's home as it was. I called up to make a, a reservation, thinking it was going to be just like calling a B&B &B or something. Well, it wasn't. The gentleman that bought the home was running it as a home for the hikers off the Appalachian Trail. That was his goal, to give them a place to stop and stay, have a good meal, a good night's sleep, and continue on their trip. So he was very skeptical 
that I wanted to visit Jane House. So I said, well, it was because of the music and what I had read about the woman. And as soon as I said, Betty Smith, oh, well, why didn't you say that? So of course we got rooms. So I ordered two rooms and my friends from Blue Ridge were meeting us up there. So we went, we met Alma, it was wonderful. The house hadn't changed since Jane lived there. The hikers don't care. So we came in that evening and we sat down to dinner. It was very nice, nice group of people. And um, this one man came to the table and uh, he was a hiker and he was staying just one night. They all have a trail name, and his trail name was Elf. So we met Elf that night. We all retired, went to bed. Next morning we came down to breakfast, same group, sitting at the table. Well, it was rumored that Jane Hicks roamed the house at night but she always went to room four because if there was a baby or a child, he would be here, she would be in that room. So we came down to breakfast and everyone greeted each other and how did you sleep? And Elf said he did not sleep at all. Somebody kept coming in his room and opening and closing the door. My friend Carol said, you must be in room four. He said, yeah. She said, that's Jane's room. That's the room that Jane will go visit. Oh, he was totally freaked out, totally freaked out. So we got ready to pack up and leave. And Elma, who ran the inn, said to us, there's bushels of apples out there. Please take all you want and you know, take them with you. So I went out and packed up a big bag of apples to take home with me and make pie. And Elf came to me and said, let me help you. I'll carry them for you. So he carried them to the car for me. And I don't know why, when I opened the back of the car and he saw the coffin, he just totally <laughs> freaked out. <laughs> Thinking somebody was in it. <laughs> he just totally freaked out. But anyway, that's, that's, that's the kind of people that, that have lived there and, and just incredible people. Um, these are all about the instruments, the people. There was one other today, uh, I hate to do notes, but sometimes I have to. Um, Back in the 1920s, 1930s, um, a lot of New Yorkers were starting to travel down to the mountains. And um, they were actually buying up whatever they could buy. They were totally blown away by the talent that they saw there. You cannot imagine what these people what they can do. Oh God, incredible. Um, weavers, potters, blacksmiths, cooks. Um, moonshiners. Moonshine. Well, if you had a bushel of corn, okay. You had a bushel of corn. That bushel of corn is gonna get you what? As a bushel of corn. <laughs> gonna get you 10 times that in moonshine. So what would you do? Sell the corn and make the moonshine. Easy. Moonshine. The Clay County was a dry county too, just up until just a couple of years ago, total dry, dry county. But this ugly character here, the space jug, they say they're always so ugly because granddaddy could hide his moonshine in there and the, and the young'uns wouldn't dare to touch it. They wouldn't dare to. 
So that's what the face jug is, is all about. <coughs> but when the um, people started traveling to the mountains and actually seeing what these people did, they were buying it all up and bringing it home and selling it for two and three times what they were paying for it. You can go online and check out the Southern Highlands Craft Guild. And if you want to see what these people do, totally, totally, totally amazing. Um, so when you, when you do come up and look at the instruments, um, this one here, is a very old one. And some, some probably farmer, some man, probably made this for his lovely wife. Um, you can see, it's to me, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I think of who would have made it, who would have held it, who would have played it. But this is a very, very old, you won't see sound holes like that today. But this here is a three string, and it originally started out as a three string instrument. And um, they didn't play all across the strings as we do today. We strum across all the strings. They would have used a turkey um feather a goose quill or a noter and they would only play up and down the string this way um and and some of the really old timers um even tried playing it with a short bow you know like you would a, a fiddle but this is a really, really old instrument. And the old instruments all have wooden tuning pegs, whereas today we have the lovely mechanical tuners, which make it so much easier for us. But I think it's just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. When you say old, how old is old? 1700s. Whoa, that's old. Yeah, yeah. What are the strings made out of? Um, drawn steel? Yeah, today they're nylon. Nylon, yeah. This one, this was another amazing man. Oh my God, Homer, God bless you, I love you. This gentleman, Homer Ledford, he um, passed away not too long ago. He was one of my favorite people I ever, ever met at the folk school. He was probably six foot six, he was the tallest, skinniest person I ever met in my life. And um, when he was a young boy, he was not well. In fact, they didn't think he was even gonna survive. So his folks sent him up to the folk school to see if he could learn a tree. Well, Marguerite took him under her wing and she started giving him little odd wood jobs to do. Well. An instrument came in and needed it to be repaired. And Homer was only a young boy, maybe 14 at the time. And she asked Homer, did he think he could repair that instrument? And he did. And they didn't expect him to survive. Not only did he not survive, he became one of the most well-known instrument builders and the actual um, woodshop teacher at Berea College. So he lived a long, good, healthy life. And I was very fortunate to take a dulcimer building class with him. And he was just always amazing. What a luthier. And he had his own band. And he played, and, and that was his whole life, his instruments and his music. And this is a courting dulcimer. The young folks could sit and play together, play the dulcimer in the other room. As long as they heard music coming, they knew everything was under control. <laughs> so that's the courting dulcimer, and that is home. As I do have 
four of Homer's instruments. Um, an hourglass shape, a teardrop shape. <laughs> but he was just such an amazing, amazing man. And I took the dulcimer workshop with him. And um, this is the one that I built. And it's totally traditional with the wooden tuning pegs and uh, the sound heart sound holes, only four strings. But while I was working on this, I told you about the history center with the wall covered with pledges. Any kind of the any kind of pledge you could imagine. And in the history center they have a lot of the old, really lovely things to see. So I had been in there and John Jacob Niles was a song catcher and he did um, save a lot of a lot of songs. His instrument was in the history center and we're going way back. So I went in to check it out and I saw how his heart were placed with the point coming up and the round heart to the bottom. So while I was working on this, and it was on the table, I'll never forget this day as long as I live. Homer walked in, walked over to me, and he'd come to the table and he'd pick his leg up and he'd lay it flat on the table. That's how long he was. He was like a string bean. Put his leg across the table, looked at it and said, Carolyn, you might want to change those sun holes. Don't you want them headed the other direction? I said, no, I don't. John Jacob Niles, that's what he did. That's what I want. So he, he was just, he was just an incredible, incredible man. He just received the Heritage Award a few years just before he passed away. But he's somebody that should have been documented and, and you know, he was just a wonderful, wonderful person. But they're all wonderful there. And then when they started all the socialites going to the south and bringing everything back, in the meantime, um, in Greenwich Village, Jean Ritchie showed up. The Ritchie family are so well known. If it weren't for Jean Ritchie, I don't know as the folk music would be or this music would still be as alive today as it is, but Jean Ritchie, her family, their songs, you, you, you can't imagine their, their play party songs, um, the lyrics, they're just incredible. She came up to Greenwich Village with a dulcimer, and that started the whole migration of the dulcimers up here. It's been said one was given to, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, I don't know whatever happened, or, you know, never heard any more documented about it. But the entire Ritchie family, who lived in Viper, Kentucky, were incredible for keeping this music alive. And she only, they were, she just passed away a few years ago. She and Homer were, were very, very good friends. She also received the, um, Kentucky Heritage Award, but um, I got to see her. I got to take a workshop with her, and it was it was just amazing, just incredible to be in her presence. And uh, we took a workshop with her, my friend and I, and it just so happened the workshop fell on my husband's birthday. So uh, we went and did the workshops all day, then the gentlemen, our husbands, three of them said, we'll meet you there and we'll go out to dinner, celebrate Dave's birthday. So that was the plan. We played music all day and we, just to be in her presence was incredible. So that evening they set out a buffet for the dinner and they asked, well, Jean asked if we were staying 
And I said, well, we're going out. It's my husband's birthday. We need to take him out. Okay, so we're all dressed up. We're dressed to the nines. I forget what town we were in, but there were no restaurants there. We drove around, we drove around. There was nowhere to go eat. We ended up going back to the hall where the buffet was still going on and get some dinner. And Jean asked me, she said, what happened? I said, there's nothing out there to eat, nowhere to eat. She just laughed. She said, go up there and get me the biggest piece of cake on that table and put it up there underneath my chair on the stage. And I said, okay, so I did just what she told me. And I put that under her chair. And that evening they started their program for us, singing and playing, and oh, it was incredible. Then she stopped and she started to sing. She said, is David out there? Well, my husband is so bashful. I thought he was gonna crawl under the chair. It's Dave out there. Dave, she makes him stand up and she sings happy birthday to him. I'm like, you can never, ever repay me for this. This <laughs> up, I mean, God, it was incredible. The woman was amazing. But she and her family, they've kept the music alive, God bless them, and um, just, just amazing people. Just. Totally, totally incredible. Anyone you meet, um, anything. These are the catalogs from the folk school. Come up, take a look, give you an idea of what a, what kind of talent is there. I had a um, friend give me a walking wheel. And does anybody know what a walking wheel is? When you see old spinning wheels and you see one with the wheel that's about yay high, huge. Well, I was given this walking wheel by a friend. I had just been learning spinning and learning on a treadle, treble um, wheel. <clears throat> when she gave me this walking wheel, no one could tell me how to operate this thing. Well, I went to the folk school and the head weaver had a walking wheel all set up and ready to go to teach me how to use it. And they would spin. And the whole thing with the walking wheel, at least you could sit at a treble, but with the walking wheel, you had to walk your yarn oh. all the way out, and then you had to bring it all the way back to wind it up. They did this day in and day out. <laughs> so anyway, they got me so that I could use my walking wheel, and, and it, it is lovely. Um, Do you use it now? I haven't in a long while. Hmm. I have collecting dust. Huh? Hmm? Just collecting dust? No, I, I, I just love I just love it. Okay. I just love it. It it's um it has what they call a miner's uh it was just so hard to set up. There was nobody that could help me to set it up. But I did get it set up, I did get it running, and I did use it. But right now I just spend too much time at the plantation. What? At the plantation. Oh, I was going to say, with your puppy. <laughs> oh, with my puppy. I almost brought him tonight. I have a new five-month-old Terra. Oh, my God, he's a pistol. Um, Five-month-old Red Doby, and he's in training. So I almost had to bring him tonight, but um, my trainer said, no, he's staying home. <laughs> but anyway, I want, oh, and I'm going to introduce this one more dulcimer before I go on. Did I forget anything? And are you going to play for us? I might. See, now, I'm not a, I'm not a professional. I'm a recreational player. I play for my 
my enjoyment. When I worked, and we had a restaurant in Wareham, the Rosemary Inn, and when I would finish at 11 o'clock at night, I would go home and sit and play my Nelson until 1 o'clock. I hated to go to bed. <laughs> but um, all of Dame, God bless her, she's from Medford, Mass. This book here, I've put a few um, post-its in here because there's pictures of what the old homestead would have looked like. How the children were. I mean, oh God, and what wonderful, wonderful cooks these people are. Oh, amazing. So wherever I have a post-it or a paper is, is a good photo. Um, and these, these are about the building of the Delsima. But in a nutshell, and I'm going to introduce you to that one, but in a, in a nutshell, oh, and we're going to have a cakewalk. This is, set your feet in the common soil. There are the roots of life. There you must learn to stand. Begin in the plain every day, not in the blue heavens, and grow upward. Must you not plow the field before you gather the harvest? Love life. Hate no one. With joy and sorrow, hope and faith, you should here on earth build a bridge to the stars. Olive Dane. And that's, I think, just the most beautiful way to think and the way they did. It, just lovely, lovely people. But Olive Dane wrote that. She was amazing. Um, oh, I took doll making, which I love to do, but I, I love to bake. Um, instruments today, if you're interested, and anybody wants to find a dulcimer, if I were to recommend one, I would recommend Blue Lion in California, Janita Baker. They make a beautiful instrument. She's an amazing player and singer um, and affordable. Dulcimers today, if you'd like to see some more, I have 26 if you'd like to come and visit them. <laughs> but you don't get it. <laughs> I have 26 dulcimers, two banjos, three banjos, one I built. What happened to the harp? I always meant to ask you. Oh, I have a harp. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a fiddle. I love the fiddle. <laughs> but I love music. But anyway, Janita Baker, she makes a very fine instrument. You can go online today and find... Um, in the mountains, you can still find them. Um, folk craft is a local uh, builder, um, probably the same price as, as Janita Baker's. Hers her far surpass his. If I could have brought one, I would have brought one she built for me. I love pigs, and she put little pigs in all my sound holes. Oh, it's just so sweet. Um, <laughs> but that's the, that was just because I love pigs. Um, I have three of her instruments. I have this, this one here is a new today instrument, but when I show you the pig head on this one, this is beautiful, is it not? Well, one of the original dulcimer makers, um, a company called Sunhearth, if you can find a Sunhearth dulcimer, you want it. Um, he, he passed all of his, uh, what would you call them, drawings on to this gentleman here, Dwayne Wilder, um, who's in, um, up in the Berkshires. A mountain instrument today depending the wood most builders you can specify what kind of wood you want 
Um, depending on the wood, you're probably starting at three or four hundred dollars and on up. This gentleman here requires half down and he has a five year wait. That's how popular, how wonderful, but they're out of sight. Um, when I die, this goes with me. <laughs> this and my, my, my... In the coffin. My, In the coffin. Yes, this and my five tins of puppy ashes. Uh, That's all I want to go with me. What about your husband? My what? Your husband. He doesn't go with her. He doesn't, he doesn't go, go with, with me. No? No, it's this and the puppy. I have five tins. I have five tins and I still have two dogs with four legs. <laughs> so I don't know. My but husband's going with me. <laughs> I tell my kids all the time. This goes with me, and my all the ashes go with me. Excuse me. But if you ever want to hear some professional, uh, you ever heard of Aubrey Atwater? Amazing musician from Rhode Island, and also a clogger. That was the other thing the mountain people did. Clogging. They, they, now they call it clogging. They called it flat footing. Huh. And um, that, was their, that was their dance. That's what they did. They played music and they danced, but they deserved it. They worked so hard. But um, I was in Pennsylvania for a um, Lincoln reunion we belong to a group called the Lincoln Forum, and all it does is study Abraham Lincoln. And every November Remembrance Weekend, you meet in um, Gettysburg, and you live Lincoln for the weekend. And my hubby and I um, went one week. We went more than once, but one week that we did go, I decided to go out and take a walk that night, late in the afternoon, and there was a music store. So that's where I went. In the music store, sitting on the shelf, was a Sun Hearth dulcimer. <clears throat> I should have brought that one too. My sister made me bring the one I made. I wanted to bring the Sun Hearth, but I should have brought the Sun Hearth so you could see where the pattern, how it's evolved from what it was. But when I saw the sun hearth, I was like, ooh. So I asked the man about it. He said, I bought it for my daughter. She doesn't want it. He said, I'm selling it. How much? I have it. <laughs> but um, that's where this originated. Whereas most of them today aren't quite as elaborate. But Aubrey Atwater and Elwood Donnelly, husband, wife team, amazing people. And the other one is Lorraine and Bennett Hammond. If you can ever get them because um, they're traveling all over the all over the country playing. They even go to Scotland to teach and play. They're just just they're the top. But these are the people that are carrying this all on. Jean Ritchie did her part. Homer Ledford. Um, and, and it's these people that are still carrying on the old oral tradition. People learned by hearing, not by music. They, they learned by hearing. So this is, this is a, um, Dwayne Wilder. And I'm not a professional. I'm a recreational player. But this.
I'm sorry, I get so nervous. <laughs> oh, listen. Sorry. That's um that's the um Ashokan farewell. Um in case she didn't recognize it. <laughs> but the Ashokan farewell, everyone thinks it's a old tune, an antique tune. It's not. Jay Unger. Anybody here know Jay Unger? If you if you see it, uh he's amazing fiddler. And he runs a camp in um, Ashokan, in New York, and uh, a fiddle camp every August. And one year when the camp was just finishing for the week, he wrote that tune called the Ashokan Farewell. But it also became the music for the Ken Burns uh, Civil uh, War series. Yeah. So because of that, everyone thinks it's an old tune. It's not. It's a new tune. But J. 
Jay Unger and Molly Mason, oh, wonderful people. Um, we went to see them in um, the Zyterian in, in New Bedford. And that is a great place, mm -hmm. great, great, great place. But anyway, when you go there, you see how big the uh, auditorium is. And I wanted to buy my tickets there so I would know where we were going to be sitting. So I went down in New Bedford to get tickets. And when I got up to the window, um, I wanted to see the seating plan. And she told me it didn't matter. It was $125. And they were only selling, it was something like 25 or 30 tickets. And how can you make any money? Jay, it's the music. Jay, it's the people. She said, this is not going to be an auditorium. He's on the stage, and there's maybe eight tables set around the stage. And you're as close to Jay and Molly as if, I mean, it was just incredible. They played, they roamed, and I mean, it was just as close as this is now. The table's but up on the stage? Up on the stage. Huh. His thing is, these are his people, and he is there for his people. He's an amazing artist, but it's all from his heart. It's just the way he is. That was his, that was his doing. That's how he wanted it. So, I mean, he, he's amazing. Check these people out. They're incredible. But we're gonna have a cakewalk. And, um, I'm sorry. What's the cake? Back in, back in the settlements, whenever there was work to be done or, um, something needed being done if they were lucky enough to have a school, um, whatever it was that the community, these people lived in settlements. And um, if something needed to be done, they didn't have the money, they held a cakewalk. And the ladies of the community would bake their finest cakes I tried. and they would hold a cakewalk. Well, we're gonna have a cakewalk. We have three cakes tonight. It's um, usually is a fundraiser, so it's gonna be a fundraiser. For so our fund. <laughs> what? For our fund. Oh, for your gotcha, funds. Gotcha. Yes, for your <laughs> funds. So anyway, what what it basically boils down to is you have numbers on the floor. There's music playing, and when the music stops, the person calls a number without looking, and who's ever on that number gets their pick of the cake. So we can do this three times, because we have three cakes. Yeah, yeah, cake this, block. And these are, these are all period recipes, too, or historical in some aspect. Gingerbread? Yeah. She found the most historical recipe she could. <laughs> Boston cream pie. Oh, my God, I love that. Oh, <laughs> you know that's what was invented. Oh, I, I have a little piece about the Boston cream pie. <laughs> you have what? Wait a minute. And this is a Appalachian stack cake. Which is? It's a stack cake, very <coughs> mountainish. That's what they did. Um, it's very spicy layers, six layers. They're baked paper thin. This is how they, and they're very spicy. Ginger, nutmeg, cinnamon, allspice. And between each layer is um, an apple filling, like an apple compote. And that's an Appalachian stack cake. Okay, Boston cream pie. It's not a pie. 
it's really a cake. It was especially with the Boston Parker House Hotel, dating back to 1855, and it is the official dessert of the state of Massachusetts. Yes. Really? Yeah, that, see that, we got, we got food. And the gingerbread recipe came from Mrs. Lou from Colorado. Remember the current place you could send for cards and, and different things oh, yeah. and checks? Yeah. Well, it's her recipe from many, many yeah. years ago. So where do you want me to? I don't want to run into him. Want to go in the other room? Yeah, we got all the empty.